1 Samuel 15, Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. So Saul summoned the men and mustered them at Telaim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 from Judah. Saul went up to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the ravine. Then he said to the Kenites, go away, leave the Amalekites so that I do not destroy you along with them. For you showed kindness to all the Israelites when they came out of Egypt. So the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way to Havilah, to Shur, from Havilah to Shur, near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak they totally destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all, all that night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. Enough, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites, wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag to their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Then Samuel, excuse me, Saul said to Samuel, I've sinned. I have violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe, and it tore. Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors to one better than you. Okay, this is a little side note, so don't get too caught, don't get too caught up and, and get away from the story. But does God not do things in the physical in order to help you to understand what he's doing in the spiritual? Over and over, I'm demonstrating this for you. And people say that I'm teaching extra biblically, but I am not teaching extra biblically. When I am teaching you body metaphor work, when I am teaching you to recognize the circumstances, the dreams, the memories, the feelings, everything that is going on in your life, God has sent. And he has sent it to represent what he is doing in the spiritual and what he's calling you in to address. Don't dismiss this. This is not some creative or cutesy modality that I came up with for treatment. This is biblical. Saul cut cut hold of the hem of his robe and it tore. Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. He 
who is the glory of Israel, does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a human being that he should change his mind. Saul replied, I've sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel went back with Saul and Saul worshiped the Lord. Then Samuel said, bring me Agog, king of the Amalekites. Agog came to him in chains and he thought, surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so will your mother be childless among women. And Samuel put Agog to death before the Lord at Gilgal. Then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Now let me ask you something. When God says that I've given you the keys to the kingdom, what you loose on earth is loosed in heaven, what you bind on earth is bound in heaven. When Christ says, what I open, no one can shut, and what I shut, no one can open. And when he gives his prophet Samuel permission to kill, what do you think it might mean when he gives his apostles permission to loose or bind, to open or shut? What kind of power do you think that God's servants have when the witnesses are giving, given power, that anyone who speaks against them, that anyone who tries to harm them must die by the fire coming out of their mouth. Do you think that when he gave his prophet Samuel permission to kill, that he was representing something that he might give his witnesses later on, including his apostles, in the spiritual? You need to think about that. You need to think about what happens when the Lord says enough is enough. What happens when his servants have reproved so many times and people are not obeying and they are turning and biting the messenger, speaking against them, turning on them, or just outright ignoring and running away, cowering? I'm not talking to one person. I'm using different examples because there are different situations. Many situations of those who claim to be Christian but reject God's messengers and reject his word and reject what he has already established that you must do in your covenant. I'm a little shocked at where I'm even going right now because this was not the message that I thought God had built in me, but it is the message that he is having me speak right now. It's definitely related to what he was building in me prior to me starting to record, but he's pressing this on me right now. You need to know that there comes a point where enough is enough. And Saul, in my opinion, did far less than any of my sins or what I see you doing right now. If Saul could be cut off, his position revoked, who do you think you are? Do you think you're more special? Or do you think this was done as an example to you? Samuel put Agog to death before the Lord at Gilgal. Then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went up to his home in the Gibeah of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him. Do you see that God's servants mourn for those who are lost? I was feeling this the other day about a situation, about a particular person, and I was taking it up to God and I was telling him, I feel like I'm failing. I feel like I'm failing at keeping your sheep, but what else can I do? And it's not me. It isn't me. It's not me who's failing. I've done everything I can possibly do. I've spoken to you clearly as he speaks to me. What more can I do? There are some of you who are dying. There are many of you who are dying and you don't seem to care. And do you know why? Because you hear, but you do not obey. You hear, but you do not obey. Saul heard what God said. He heard his instructions. He chose not to obey and he even had it justified in his head that it was okay, that he had obeyed the Lord but he didn't. He heard, but he didn't obey. He didn't take it seriously. He thought he could be, it would be enough if he mostly obeyed, if he did his best. But God sets a different standard. He doesn't say be holy as you are holy. He says be holy as he is holy. It's hard to get into the kingdom of heaven. I don't know how many ways I can tell you that. Counterfeit Christianity lied to you. You think it's easy. You think you just do your best. You think you just 
obey most of what God has said, but that's not what he said. That is not what he said. So whose rules do you follow? Let me tell you what happens when God removes his spirit, because he has warned us that a day of, is coming in which he is going to send a famine, not a famine of bread or thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. You ever had that happen to you? Like you ever spurned him? You ever upset him and he took his voice away from you for a day, two days, three days, maybe even a week? Or maybe you don't hear his voice anymore at all. Do you know what torment that is? It's torture. So Saul's position has been replaced by one after his own heart, God's own heart. That, of course, is King David. And in 1 Samuel 16, 14, it says, Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. You don't get to just inhabit yourself. When God's spirit leaves you, so does his peace, and fear and torment replace his spirit. Because you're a vessel. You don't occupy yourself. That peace that you take for granted, that comes from his spirit. Saul's attendants said to him, see, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Who sent it? An evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the liar. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes on you and you will feel better. God did that. You reject his spirit. His spirit rejects you and he sends a different spirit to occupy you. And he does it for his purpose. And he raised Saul for this very purpose, to be an example to you of what's going to happen. And most of you don't care, but I see some who do. The dejected ones, the ones who've been yearning and thirsting and panting for healing, for something different, who've had worthless shepherds over them, oppressing them, stealing the food from them, controlling the bread and wine. Well, guess what? They've found it. And they're not letting anything stand before it. And they're praising God. You know what it means to praise God? Does it mean to praise God when you say, praise God, praise God? Does that mean anything to God? You know what it means to praise God? To share your testimony of what he's done in your life. To show up for the body of Christ. To glorify him in all you're doing. Oh, but you have a field, huh? You have a field to go work in. You have a house that needs work. You just got married. You have a life. You don't have time. Thanks anyway. But I won't be able to attend the wedding feast. And you won't. You won't attend the wedding feast. Not with that attitude. A time is coming when this invitation will be revoked. And that time has gotten shorter and narrower. And no one cares. Where are you at? When I ask you, what are the gifts that God has given you to serve him? When I ask you, how is God building you for the kingdom of heaven right now? Do you have an answer? Or are you still concerned with self? Because God is cutting off the ones who hear but don't obey. And when that happens, you will be in famine. You will stagger and wander about with no direction. I've spoken with people who've lost his voice, who once heard him and lost his voice. They don't hear him at all. And they are in torment. This is why it is written, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. As you did in the rebellion, during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Did God say, I'll give them another chance. I'll just not have them here for a period of time and I'll give them another chance. No, he said they will never, never is definitive. Are you willing to take that chance? That while you hear the message now, you are willing to take the chance that you will be hardened so that you will never enter his rest. You will never turn to him. Though seeing they do not hear, they do not see, though hearing they do not hear, you will not have a heart to understand so that you will not turn to him and so be healed. Do you understand what you're giving up? The gods and idols that you've chosen? Because you claim to see, you claim to know, you claim to understand, you claim that you're in him. 
But if you don't obey, he will turn to you and he will say, depart from me, evildoer. I never knew you. Those who swear falsely in his name, who covet him for self, but don't even know him. And if you don't know him, he doesn't know you and you are not covered by him. It is hard to get into the kingdom of heaven. I have made myself available for an entire year for free. You think God will contend with man forever? These are the examples and the words that God has spoken. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, as you did that day at Massa in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me. They tried me, though they had seen what I did. For 40 years, I was angry with that generation. I said, there are people whose hearts go astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. That means no salvation. That means you have believed in vain because you did not obey. I'm asking you a question. How is God building you for his kingdom? What is he building you for right now for the common good? What are the gifts that God has given you? And if you can't answer that question, you better return to him. You better start showing up for the body of Christ. You better start seeking and searching for what your purpose is in him, not in your carnality, in him. Because if he's not speaking to you about that, you can't possibly be in him. The evidence of being chosen, because what are you being chosen for? You're being chosen for his body, his temple, his church, his kingdom. You have to have a function. You have to be given gifts to utilize, to enact that function. Where are you guys? I see Louisa showing up every single day to share her testimony about what she's experiencing, who God is, when she was dead, when she was in dead counterfeit Christianity, what it is that's different today. I see Amanda coming on the channel and asking questions and obeying, applying, correcting herself. I see Patrick and Patricia wanting to enter into this second Passover, taking advantage of the opportunity, the invitation that God has extended to enter that covenant. Where are the rest of you? I see Unique showing up to answer questions. Connie and Unique showing up to the second Passover to be there for other people, even though they entered the first Passover. A nine-year-old boy who showed up to give his testimony of why a certain psalm was his favorite. Because he's God, he says. Because he's God. Because he's demonstrating that he's sovereign in this psalm. And that the devil's just a dog on a string. That's out of the mouths of babes. That understanding. While the rest of you are terrified of the occult and what Satan can do. The appearance of godliness, but you deny his power. Acting as though he's an equal power to God or even has any power. But the influence and the permission that God gives him in order to fulfill his will. Where are you guys? God can erase every single one of you. <laughs> Do you get that? Myself included. If you hear, you have to obey or you'll be erased just as quickly as Saul without any opportunity. Saul tried to return after that. I sinned. I sinned. Did he try to return? Mm -mm. It was too late. Saul had a servant right alongside him telling him, these are the things that you must do. These are the things the Lord has said. But Saul thought better. You have a servant alongside you telling you what I hear from God, what he tells me to speak to you. So what's going on? Do you think you know better? Because I know you don't. I know what I hear from the Lord and I know you don't. There's no way he gives me one message and gives you another one that lets you off the hook. There's no way. The message that he had me write down before I did this video is you hear, but you do not obey. That's what he had me write down. You hear, but you do not obey. You reject God's servants. You speak against God's servants. You blame 
God's servants to justify yourself. You need to understand what you're doing, that you discredit the message in them that is from him. You are discrediting him to justify yourself. Oh, Carrie's being too hard on us. Mm. You should receive that from him because if you're in him, you will know that the things that I speak come from him. You will recognize the role that I'm in right now as an offering to him first, to God and the lamb in service to them, a gift to you before the rising of the antichrist, before God puts out the light that he's put in you, before he takes it away and you are tormented by the rest of those trumpets. If you're in him, if you believe you have that seal, you better start bearing fruit because you are only saved if you hold firmly to the word that's been preached to you in the gospel. And it, if you hold firmly to that word, you're going to bear the fruit of obedience, of responding to it. Don't just read the scroll, do what it says. You remember that you were told that by James? Faith without works is dead because God is going to do works through you. He's going to come around and he's going to prune you as a vine dresser so that you bear more fruit. Where's the fruit? It's hard for the righteous to be saved. I would think that you'd be doing anything and everything to make sure that you're one of the ones. So if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? of those who reject the message or try to manipulate and twist scripture in order to justify themselves. What are you going to say before God? But I did obey God. Didn't you see what just happened to Saul? He said, but I did obey the Lord. And his self-justification was not enough. He was rejected by God. Our self-justification will not be enough. So if you hear, make sure you obey.